<laughs> Charlie was like, get me yeah. the chief exec. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the final seminar in our course about the Scottish and Welsh elections. Um, we're now in the happy position of having lots of election data to sift through and we hope today that we'll be able to answer some of your questions. I'm happy to say that I'm joined by Jack Larner from the Wales Governance Centre at Cardiff University and also by Professor Ilsa Henderson from the University of Edinburgh. We also have on hand Anthony to monitor your comments and questions on Twitter and you can communicate with us using the hashtag SWVote16. So we kick off today with a question from Andrew Manning. Uh, it's a question about the EU referendum, and he asks whether these elections will have a direct or indirect effect on the coming EU referendum. Jack, what do you think? Well, um, I, I think the, maybe the consequences or the, um, uh, the sort of effect it may have will be more the indirect side, maybe not the direct side. Um, certainly in Wales for uh, UKIP, for example, um, they had a very, very strong election performance, went from uh, zero seats to seven seats, um, saw large swings towards them across most of um, South Wales in particular. Um, and this may like buoy their activists, give them a shot of confidence, and also give um, UKIP uh, quite a, a strong platform, which they didn't have before in order to um, talk about this uh, pro-Brexit type um, uh, pro Brexit type message, which perhaps was maybe missing before in Wales. Mm. Um, so, so I think, um, yeah, the indirect effects on UKIP will certainly be one to watch in Wales. Yeah, in Scotland, I mean, I think there's a couple of things going on. I don't think there's a direct effect, but I, I do think that there might be some messages there in terms of turnout. So certainly supporters of the SNP will know that even if you expect a certain result, if turnout is low, you don't necessarily get that result. So it might lead supporters... Um, for we know that in, in Scotland, certainly the Remain side is in the lead. It might lead supporters of Remain to, uh, to, to go out and, and vote. On the other hand, we know from all the turnout literature that electoral fatigue matters and dampens turnout. So there's, there's cross pressures there. I think in terms of the result, um, the other thing worth noting is that, you know, the increase of Scottish um, of MSPs from the Conservative Party to 31 means that we're now hearing voices we didn't hear before. Uh, about Brexit and we're hearing also that there are you know, divisions. So there are MSPs who are supportive of, of Remain and there are MSPs who are supportive of Leave. And before the, before the election, we were hearing predominantly from those who were on the Remain side. That's no longer the case. Mm. So we're hearing more divisions within the Conservative Party, what we used to associate with Conservatives down in London, but now is a feature of, of Conservative politics up in Scotland as well. So that might change the, the nature of the debate a little bit. OK, and we move on now to a question from Peter Campbell about the SNP. And he, he asked whether the SNP should see it as a failure and not getting a majority. Was it their strength in the constituencies and so failure in the list seats that was to blame for that? Yeah, I, I don't think they should see it as a failure not to get a majority. I mean, it's, it's a comment on how much Scottish politics has changed. And that we can even ask mm. questions like that. We, we move immediately to examine the, the minority government um, and, and jump over that and start talking about Labour's collapse and the rise of the Conservatives. I don't think in, in 1999 we would have predicted that. I, I don't think it's a failure. I think it is the functioning of the electoral system in some ways. Um, it, so take, for example, uh, Glasgow, the, the list. You know, the, the SNP won every single constituency there and so therefore didn't win any of the regional seats. So there's 111,000 voters who backed the SNP on that regional list. They didn't get any of the regional MSPs, but that's that's more than than um, than Labour and the Conservatives combined on that. So yes, the electoral system matters, but I think there's more things going on. I think turnout was uh, unexpectedly low, so we know that Scotland is more engaged after the referendum, but we also know that when voters expect a clear result, they're more likely to stay at home and not cast a ballot. I think turnout absolutely played a part, and if we think of some of the constituency contests where the SNP lost to other parties, constituencies like Aberdeenshire West. 
If turnout had moved from just 59% to 64% and those extra people had voted for the SNP, that would have been the seat won. And they, because they didn't win any seats on the regional list, that wouldn't have been balanced out by a loss elsewhere. That would have just been a net gain for the SNP. So that's going on. Um, I think there's also tactical voting uh, happening for, the, for supporters um, of parties other than the SNP. They're shifting their, their vote and parking them with what they perceive to be uh, the best winner. I don't think that can be considered a failure of, of the SNP. If anything, that might well be a mark of their, of their success. And the last thing I think um, that can be um, pointed to if we're talking about a, a minority government is split ticket voting, people backing different parties on the constituency and, and the regional list. There's a gap of 106,000 voters between what the SNP earned in the constituency contest and what they earned in the regional contest. And it depends where in the regions they are, but if they had picked up even half of those, we might well be talking about a majority government. Mm. And turning now to Wales, Jack, um, J Joy Dillon asks, um, what was the single most substantial issue that swayed most voters towards the winning party? And it was in a position to say anything about that? Yes. Yeah, so, um if, whenever you do polling in Wales, the three issues always come top, and the most important issue for voters. And uh, the top one is always health. And then second and third place normally switches between the economy and immigration. Now, of course, at an assembly election, a devolved election, health is actually the only devolved, fully devolved issue there. Um, the economy has, um, there's some powers that the Welsh government have, and there's some powers that the UK government have. And for immigration, obviously, that's purely controlled by the UK, uh, UK government. So if you want to look at it for a single issue, I suppose you could say that health and the NHS is, you know, the biggest issue in Wales. Um, but however, even that, that's not entirely clear because um, a lot of news, for example, from the Welsh NHS, um, negative news anyway, comes from London um, and the UK government. Um, David Cameron infamously referred to Offers Dyke, which is the line between England and Wales, sort of the line between life and death when referring to the failings of the Welsh NHS. Um, and of course, this uh, assembly election also had sort of marauding um, uh, issues of the EU, um, which played a prominent role, um, inevitably, perhaps, and steel, mm. um, which again is an issue which the Welsh government will have some uh, authority over, but also the UK government and the EU. So to pinpoint a specific issue on which people would have voted for, I think is hard because we know things like um, the competence of governments at both levels will play a role. Um, how people perceive leaders um, of parties will play a role, um, and then these issues. So, um, while health is um, sort of named as the most important issue, it's, it's sort of a melting pot of things which decides how people cast their ballot. Mm. And can we stick on Wales for a moment, Jack? Just you mentioned UKIP. Sure. So, Ian McKellar asked about um, talking about conservative decline and UKIP rise in Wales. Was this in part thanks to the EU referendum with you kept taking votes from the Tories on the regional ballot because of their Eurosceptic stance? Um, I, I think that might be part of the story, but certainly not the, f the, f the full picture. Um, if you actually look at the numbers, where UKIP do best is actually in uh, South East Wales in the Valleys areas. Um, and these are you know, very, very strong Labour heartlands. Um, and in these areas, the Conservative vote has dropped by about 4%. Um, so it is dropping, but in these areas, the Labour vote has dropped by an average of 13%. So what we see here is actually UKIP are taking votes not from uh, Tory voters, but from these disaf uh, disaffected, basically, Labour voters in these um, you know, uh, post-industrial areas um, that suffer from a lot of deprivation. So they seem to be manifesting in these areas as a anti-Labour protest vote. Um, rather than it measuring specifically um, uh, displeasure with the EU. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a lot more complex than um, uh, UKIP taking votes from the Conservatives in these areas, yeah. Okay. Um, just before we take some questions from Twitter, um, should we talk about Scottish Labour, Ilsa? Um, so Linda Murphy asks, is the Labour Party finished in Scotland and why did they gain a seat from Edinburgh, from seat in Edinburgh from the SNP? Mm -hmm. And David Turnbull also asked, um, does the panel see any future for Labour in Scotland? Yeah, two, two different things. In terms of Edinburgh Southern, I think there's three things going on. I think that was clearly a tactical vote on, on the part of, of um, voters who supported parties other than the SNP. I think that's, that there's, there was evidence of that in 2015 in the UK general election. I think there's evidence of that 
Now, I think there's two other pieces of information. So one is that they had an appealing local candidate with roots in the community who people know. And, and I think the other thing is that Ian Murray is a very popular MP. He's a, a Labour MP for, for that, the, the overlap between those um, Westminster and Hollywood constituencies. He's an active MP. He's, um, you know, indicators of how uh, active MPs are with their constituents. He's usually consistently up there. He's well known, he's well liked, and I think that probably played in their favor. Yeah. In, terms of, in terms of Labour's challenges, I, I think there's a couple of things going on. I think it's very clear that their tax policy is at odds with what we might consider to be the preference of the, the average voter, the median voter. We know that voters don't want tax rates that are different from tax rates in the rest of the UK. So there's a challenge there. I think the other challenge they have is that they are not perceived to stand up for Scotland. And the SNP is clearly winning that battle. It was always winning that battle, but the gap was never as large as it is at the moment. The other thing is that if you look at the opinion polls, even supporters of Labour, even people who intend to vote for them, are least likely to say they understand what the party stands for. So about 60% of them say, I understand what Labour stands for. Whereas other parties get you know, 90%, 85% from the people who are supporting them. So there's clear challenges there. Um, the good thing of that, I suppose, is that a, lo a lot of that is about policy choices and clarity. And so the solutions are fairly straightforward. Find a policy on the Constitution that you can um, get behind and you can communicate to voters in a way that resolves narratives about social solidarity, but also means you're not always reacting to the policies of parties at the polls. And the other is either find a way to convince people on tax or at least find policies that are more appealing to the median voter on tax. The leader does not appear to be the problem. Certainly her uh, approval ratings are lower than they are for Nicola Sturgeon and Ruth Davidson. But I think you know, the reports that suggest just churning through another leader is just going to add to the problem are absolutely right. OK, um, at that point, will we take some uh, comments and questions from Twitter, Anthony? Yes, Ellen, we've got a question on Twitter from Sambit Paul who asks, um, what do the Welsh election results and also the whole UK local election results mean for Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, we've also got a comment on Twitter from Anna Thompson who asks about uh, Nathan Gill, who is currently an MEP, uh, also elected as an Assembly member in Wales, and what is the process or the precedent for MEPs in the UK um, holding another elected office at the same time? Um, and perhaps maybe just one more question uh, from Nick Hubble, who asks, uh, why did the party leaders seem to do quite well in constituency seats in the vote? Mm. Okay, uh, Jack. Yeah. Um, so the question on, uh, firstly, on Nathan Gill, the UKIP leader, it's quite nice and simple. Um, so the Electoral Commission stated that uh, if Nathan Gill was elected, which he was, uh, he'd have to resign as an MEP. Um, this actually causes some sort of very interesting problems for UKIP um, because they'll have to replace Nathan Gill um, from the original European list of candidates that they had. Um, the problem is, at the moment, uh, everyone who was on that list is now elected to the Assembly. Ah. Um, so there's a possibility that someone who has ele been elected, one of the UKIP AMs, will actually have to step down from their role as an AM and take up the position in the European Parliament. And then someone who was further down the regional list on the, for the UKIP assembly election will then take the place. Um, so there is a lot of uh, confusion, perhaps, um, amongst everyone, I would say, on, on the exact, exact process um, of what's happening. Um, and then to talk about maybe Corbyn. Yep. Um, so the Welsh election result for Labour, I think, should be seen as a success because they did, you know, the vote share dropped, but they, the old thing is sort of that they lost seats where they could afford to. They only lost one seat, and that was in a sort of a quite a shocking circumstances, losing the Ronda to uh, Plaid Leader Leanne Wood. Um, but in terms of what it means for um, Jeremy Corbyn and his leadership, well, something that was sort of uh, very, very obvious throughout the whole campaign was the absence of Jeremy Corbyn in Wales. Um, there was lots of talks of Caroline Jones, the leader of, uh, leader of uh, Welsh Labour, um, specifically asking Corbyn to stay away um, is not to bring over the baggage from UK Labour, you know, all the problems they've had. Um, so I'm not sure if the Welsh election results actually tell us that much at all about Corbyn. Um, it, it's, it's more a focus on um, Welsh Labour. Um, and actually, sort of to bring in something that Elsa was saying about um, the future of Scottish Labour, something Welsh Labour have always managed to do very well is distinguish themselves from UK Labour. Um, 
something which Scottish Labour perhaps haven't done as effectively. But you know, so for that reason, um, the, I think the results in Wales should be viewed um, quite independently from what's going on in the UK Labour. Mm. Elsa. In terms of the impact on, on Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, I, th I, I don't think we can suggest that the presence of Jeremy Corbyn as a Labour leader has damaged Labour in Scotland. I think there are enough domestic reasons for the current difficulties that Labour finds itself in before we go looking outside the borders of, of Scotland um, and for some of the reasons that I've, I've, I've mentioned um, earlier. In terms of the leaders and why they did so well in the constituency contests, I mean, clearly it's visibility. Clearly we've got, the, you know, the media tracking where they are. And so even when they're not in your own constituency, we see them on the news every night. And if anything, it shows that the longer you are leader, the better you will do. Because certainly Ruth Davidson had a far more successful election campaign than she did a UK general election campaign. Um, and then even in the, the 2011 uh, campaign when she came in off the list. So the longer you're a leader, the, the, the more you will reap the rewards of that visibility. I think with Kezia Dugdale, it just, you know, let's give it time and see mm. what happens. Mm. OK, we move on to a question about the Scottish Greens. Um, Bill Dodds asks, um, the, the shift in voting between constituency and list is noticeable for the Greens. Are the variations proportionally significant? Do the Greens pick up list votes from Labour and the SNP? And a similar question from Pat Audy as well. Yeah, they, um, well, they predominantly stand on the list. So absolutely there are, there are variations in support. So it's 0.6 on the constituency contest for Scotland as a whole, but 6.6 .6 for the regional list. Yes, absolutely we know that they're picking up their support from particular places. They're picking up about 10% of the SNP vote. So 10% of those who vote SNP on the constituency ballot vote green on the, on the regional ballot. They're picking up about 5% of Labour support 5% of Lib Dem support. They're not really drawing from the Conservatives so much. And we can see that if we look where else people are going, um, we, it, it also matters that the SNP support leaks the most, I guess you would say, mm. in that they are, they are most likely to go to another party and, and park that vote with, uh, and they park it predominantly with the Greens. So it's more a link with the SNP than it is with Labour, I would say. Labour tends to leak equally to other parties. OK. And just a, a, a final thought on the Greens from Rose Harvey, who asks, um, are the Greens in a position of power and influence, given that they only got um, six MP, um, MSPs? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think the extent to which we think the Greens have influence depends in part on what the SNP wants to do. If the SNP wants to hold another independence referendum, I think the Greens become far more important because it really is only the Greens that will support them in that bid. And that's where the Greens might be able to trade something in return for that support. If, however, an independence referendum is not something that's in the immediate future for the SNP, if that's not something that they want, then I think the importance of, of the Greens is lessened a little bit. I mean, one thing about a minority government is that it does give more power to the non-governing parties. And I think that's true for the Greens and it's true for the others. But I think there's challenges for the Greens and, and their ability to exert influence on the SNP. One is that their tax policy is completely at odds with what the majority of voters want. The majority of voters don't want tax rates to be different from the rest of the UK. And so a significant rise, as they're proposing, is just not appealing to the majority of voters. Related to that, the SNP has shown itself very adept at chasing the average voter or the median voter on the issue of tax, partly because the tax take won't increase, but also because we know that, uh, about popularity. I think the other challenge for them is that the, the SNP, like all parties, is, is a divided party. And there's a distinction between uh, what people who are party members think what people who are supporters of the party, who vote for the party, think, and what its own MSPs think. And I think the interesting divisions are within those who's, who vote for the SNP. There's a, a divide between those who say the most important issue are things like tackling austerity or Trident or the environment, and those who say the most important issues are creating jobs, the economy, health, education. The SNP support, therefore, is kind of divided there. Only one half of that portion, the, the tackling austerity, environment, anti-trident side, is closest to the Greens. The others, the other side, the other constellation, is actually much closer to the other parties. And so I think there's, a, there's an issue there, there's a challenge there for the Greens in their attempt to 
exert influence over the over the SNP administration. Mm. And sticking with parliamentary politics, Jack, um, David Carver asked about the Lib Dems and the fact that they won't be able to form a group. And he wants to know who decides whether a party exists or not at the Welsh Assembly and what are the implications for a party if it exists or not? Sure. Um, well, it says in the standing orders of the Assembly, which is sort of, sort of the rule book, that um, in order for a party to be recognised as a group, um, they have to return three AMs. Um, I think the original thinking behind this was just to sort of limit Assembly business to a manageable amount because um, some of the things that, uh, or privileges that a group is given is, for example, uh, the chance at First Minister's questions um, to question the First Minister. Um, of course, if you had then th 30 or 20 independents, this would make things take a very, very long time. Um, so that's one of the privileges that the Liberal Democrats will lose. I say Liberal Democrats, it's just Kirsty Williams now, uh, the leader. Um, so in order to question the First Minister, she will have to submit an oral question, um, and then which everyone does sort of a week beforehand, and then who gets to ask is uh, drawn out of a hat, basically. So there's no uh, guarantee she'll be able to um, ever ask the First Minister questions. Um, another thing they will lose is um, extra funding. So when you're a group, you um, receive uh, extra funding from the Assembly, um, just to operate better because you're expected to hold the government to account in a different sort of way than an independent AM would be. Um, you also lose a place on things like the business committee which decides how um, assembly business is carried out. Um, so so I mean, it's very hard to operate as an individual AM in the assembly. Um, perhaps one of the um, benefits is that you're guaranteed a place on a committee um, but there's rumours, for example, that uh, Kirsty Williams may decide instead to just sort of packing that side of it and go for a presiding officer job. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Interesting. OK, um, on that note, let's take some questions and comments from Twitter. Uh, yes, I've got uh, one comment question on Twitter from Mandy Rhodes, um, who asks about uh, the, the success of the Scottish Tories in the election, saying that um, if someone had uh, mentioned um, several months ago that the Scottish Conservatives would be the second largest party, party in Scotland, it would be quite a surprise. Um, that's what we've got for the moment. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, fair, a fair comment. Uh, the Scottish Tories, Ilsa? Yeah, I think it comes down to two things. I think it comes down to crowding and clarity. So I think if you look at the uh, about a party space in Scotland, if, if you look at it on a left-right spectrum, for example, then you've got a lot of crowding on the, on the left, centre-left, and you've, you've got a bit of clear blue water on, on the right. So I, I, think, um, I think the Conservatives benefited from the fact that they, they weren't competing against parties tightly up against them in terms of their policies and preferences. I think the other thing that they benefited from is, is an issue of clarity, and we know that absolutely mattered on the issue of independence. They, uh, wh whether you believe them or not is, is another issue, but they were absolutely clear that we are the defenders of the union. If you support the union, you should back us. Um, we will absolutely vote no in any independence referendum. And I think that clarity is appreciated by voters. And I think that is uh, directly what ha has um, introduced difficulties for, for Labour. It's been absolutely hammered by voters for not knowing what the policies of, of Labour are on the Constitution. And you can see that when you look at the opinion polls, you know, the proportion of people saying don't know when they're asked questions about the, lab, uh, about the Labour Party is so high. There is a considerable lack of clarity both from their own supporters and other possible voters about what Labour stand for. And that is not a problem uh, faced, by, faced by the Conservatives. I think they've also got a very popular leader. Um, and I think that, that helps as well. But absolutely, I think it's partly to do with the distribution of parties in party space in Scotland. It's an issue of benefiting from an absence of crowding on the, on the right, centre-right. And I think also it's an issue of clarity. Hmm. Um, a question from Alistair Anderson um, about minority governments. So he asked that if minority governments rely on support from other like-minded parties, in what ways can a minority government be regarded, be regarded as being different from a, a coalition, Jack? Good question. So uh, I think a coalition um, in sort of what we normally think of as a coalition is sort of a formal agreement between two or more parties um, to actually form a government. Um, so this will mean that in a coalition agreement you'll tend to get um, shared ministerial positions. Um, so for example in Wales we've had two coalition, um, two, two coalition governments. 
uh, between 2000 and 2003, we had a, a Labour Lib Liberal Democrat um, coalition. And between 2007 and 2011, we had a Labour Plaid Cymru uh, coalition. And this saw um, Plaid Cymru take a number of uh, ministers uh, and Labour take a number of ministers, for example. Um, you wouldn't get that in a minority um, sort of uh, government role. Um, what you might have is sort of an agreement with parties to uh, vote um, in confidence of you if there's a vote of no confidence, for example, and perhaps to vote through um, a budget. Um, but then sort of on specific bills, everything would be taken on a bill by bill or vote by vote basis. Um, at the same time, um, you know, it, a majority, sorry, a, um, for example, in, in Wales, Labour have now have 29 of the 30 seats. Um, so it doesn't really benefit them to go into a, a formal coalition because they sort of have a lot more power, really, or they get a lot more say um, in what they put through forward as bills. And they only need, um, you know, two defections or two people to vote with them, for example, um, and they could pass. So there's not always sort of a need for a coalition government either. OK. Any thoughts on that, Ilsen? No. No, I mean, there's, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, th I think um, I think everyone was waiting to see whether Nicola Sturgeon was going to engage in a, in a coalition or, or even a, something kind of short of that, a kind of confidence and supply arrangement um, where the other party would uh, commit to supporting, you know, m what we call money bills, but, but not um, necessarily form a, a formal coalition. But no, I mean, I think... Um, and I, I, th I think that's probably good for, for, for Scotland. I, th I think people are happy with the minority government. We've been asking questions in the Scottish election study about um, what people like, and, and there is considerable support for non-majority governments. Um, and so we'll see when the recent results come in, we'll see how people are reacting to the, to the recent minority government. Hmm. Anthony, any other questions or comments? Um, no, Alan, but that's all we've got on Twitter for now. Okay, uh, let's have a question then about um, the Constitution more in, in general than Ilsa. I mean, <laughs> some people have been saying that uh, the Constitution, uh, Scottish politics is now dominated by the Constitution. Um, some people have described it as similar to the situation in some other countries where the, the constitutional question really determines your vote above all else. Could, would it be fair to say that's the kind of situation we're entering into in Scotland? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there's evidence on both sides. I, th I think... it. It wasn't often the SNP that was raising the issue of the Constitution in this election. It was far more important to the campaign of the Conservative Party than it was to the SNP. And I think in that respect, it's a, an unusual situation of the SNP being reactive on, on the constitutional agenda. I don't think it's crowding out everything else. I think tax was really important. And I think, you know, as I was saying earlier with the Conservative Party, they benefited from an absence of crowding around them and also clarity. It's not just clarity about the constitutional position, but clarity on tax that mattered. And the parties were all attempt, if you were trying to figure out how the parties were different from one another, one very easy way to do that is to look at their tax policies. I think tax was far more important in this election for obvious reasons than it has been in previous elections. And I think that's a, a sign um, that probably conservatives would have expected that devolving more tax powers to the Scottish Parliament would make people think very carefully about how they were voting and might make them more sympathetic to a, a right or centre-right wing party. I think the Conservatives are reaping what they might have expected as benefits of that discussion. But I don't think Constitution's crowding, crowding everything out. I, th I think you know, the SNP were very careful to try and put education to the forefront and say, look, fundamentally, this is, we're about improving education. We're going to make this the most important policy. Nicola Sturgeon could not have been more clear that education was more important to her as an, as an election issue to campaign on than was the Constitution. Yeah. So I think it's there. It's, it's obviously there. It's, it's, um, it's not going to completely go away, nor, nor arguably should it. But I think, um, I, I think we're not quite in a position where we're saying that we're only ever talking about the Constitution and nothing else. Okay. And Jack, um, do you have any reflections on where, where Wales is um, at the moment after this election? So the, the big Labour mostly stayed the same, but the big change has been UKIP. Is that, is that right? Yeah, of course. Um, so well, one of the main stories is um, sort of how um, interestingly uninteresting elections in Wales are. So the last 38 elections, Labour have won the last 37 nationwide elections in Wales. Um, and it, it sort of, I think, shows just how dominant Labour are. Um, a lot have been said about the election system maybe not being fit for purpose um, because Labour saw a significant drop in their vote share but 
uh, not a, at all a significant drop in number of seats, you know, only lost the one seat. Um, but I think it sort of misunderstands the picture of just how strong Labour are in Wales. Um, for example, if you, from 2011, if we um, ignore the uh, margin, hyper marginals of Llanelli and Cardiff Central, the average uh, majority for a Labour constituency in Wales was at 5,820 votes. Um, in assembly terms, that's massive. They, they are incredibly dominant. Um, and they didn't have a great, it didn't seem like they had a great campaign, but that didn't really seem to affect them. Um, and I think one of the things that's different in Wales opposed to Scotland is that in Scotland you saw where the SNP lost constituencies, you maybe saw an anti-SNP strategic vote, so coalescing around one party. And that has not happened at all in Wales. In fact, why Labour are so safe is that the opposition is so divided. Um, so in many constituencies, you had um, sort of Labour achieving maybe 40% of the vote and then a 12% split between UKIP, Tories and Plaid Cymru. Um, so that's you know one of the big stories. And of course, yeah, UKIP getting seven votes is obviously a massive story. Um, not really a surprise, and in, in fact they sort of underperform, underperform their polling rate um, ratings. Um, we don't know yet whether this was uh, just something because of turnout. UKIP struggled to get voters out. It doesn't look like that at the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it looks like for, for at least for a while they're here to stay. With, you know, mm. so they, quite a considerable uh, number of AMs they returned. And in contrast to Scotland, a disappointing night for the Welsh Conservatives, would that be fair to think? Oh, very disappointing. I think this will be seen as quite a big failure. Um, right. I think because two months ago, maybe they were really talking about their chances of making significant gains and they were um, ahead of Plaid Cymru in the polls by um, quite a few you know, considerable percentage points. Um, and even on the night, we were hearing things about uh, potential uh, losses for Labour and gains for the Conservatives at the constituency level. Um, but that just didn't transpire in the end. Um, I think possibly um, the whole um, steel crisis really, really upset their campaign. Um, and also the EU caused massive problems. I mean, the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davis, came out um, unexpectedly uh, pro-Brexit. Um, and this, I think, took especially number 10 by surprise. So David Cameron was very absent in giving support to Andrew R.T. Davis. Um, there was a lots of divisions within the Welsh Conservatives, so in the end it turned out to be a very disappointing campaign. Mm. Ilsa, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would like to talk about the Lib Dems, mm. because we, we often talk about the, well, li lately we've been talking about the collapse of Labour, but if we're to talk about a party that's really on hard times, mm. um, that's really facing some serious challenges, that I think would be the Lib Dems. And, and on the one hand, we've got some encouraging news. So they retained Orkney and, and Shetland, um, and they picked up North East Fife and they picked up Edinburgh Western, so that's, that's, that's some good news. But I think that has to be balanced against all those lost deposits. So the ones they gained, they really did well, um, but they weren't in the running, in, and they weren't close to, to any others. And I think there's a real issue there. We know that if we look at who was voting Lib Dem uh, in the 2015 election, the vast bulk of that is, uh, if it's not retained with the Lib Dems, they're, they're off to the Conservatives. So I think we can attribute some of that Conservative performance to Lib Dems um, leaving their party and, and voting with someone else. But if, if you had to ask me, you know, who would you rather advise? Would you rather advise Labour in terms of how they could turn their fortunes around or the Lib Dems in terms of how they could turn their fortunes around? The task is far more straightforward for Labour, I think, than it is for for Lib Dems. I think they've got some challenges in terms of having been in coalition with Labour in Holyrood, coalition with uh, the Conservatives in Westminster. I think their, um, some of their policy choices are, are not um, supported by the average voter uh, and the way that they're framing them is not supported by the average voter. So there's a real challenge there for the, for the Liberal Democrats. And it, it, I'm surprised it didn't seem to you know, the penny for education just didn't seem to find any traction at all. It seemed that they have a popular leader, um, although, you know, behind, uh, behind Nicola Sturgeon and, and Ruth Davidson, um, but certainly support for the enthusiasm that Willie Rennie brought to the campaign. But I think they're in a very difficult bind. Mm. Um, and so if you're, you know, looking for grants to occupy you, mm -hmm. you know, solving that would probably um, uh, occupy your time for a good long time. Not you in particular, but <laughs> if, if anyone is interested to look at that. Um, okay. Um, 
Any other thoughts on the elections? Well, just day? to go to the, back to the Liberal Democrats mm. in Wales, you know, in Wales they're very nearly being close to being wiped out now. So Kirsty Williams, the leader um, uh, of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, or ex-leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, I should say now, um, had a fantastic individual uh, result. Um, she increased her majority um, in Brecon and Radnorshire, um, won over 50% of the vote. But elsewhere, the, the vote really collapsed. Um, they didn't hold um, any constituencies anyway before that. Um, and they were just reliant on the list seats in which they lost all of them. Um, and at Westminster now, they only have one MP in Ceredigion, Mark Williams, um, who's now the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats after Kirsty Williams uh, resigned um, on Friday uh, afternoon. Um, but yeah, they're in real trouble. And one of the things we see in Wales, when we look at uh, polling data and data from uh, the election studies, now Liberal Democrats are the least likely to turn out to vote at assembly elections in Wales, um, and also most likely to split their tickets, so mm -hmm. abandon the Liberal Democrats in the list vote, which is actually where most of their seats came from. So it's, it's a, real, a real problem for the future of the Liberal Democrats. Mm -hmm. OK, well, um, on that note, so a uh, conundrum for both the Liberal Democrats um, and the Labour Party, um, I'd like to thank um, Anthony for monitoring uh, Twitter over the past uh, few weeks, to Ilsa and to Jack for coming along to talk about these issues, and to you for participating um, so well in our course. And we hope that you'll continue uh, your interest in politics. Um, and thank you very much for your contributions and your participation in our course about the Welsh and Scottish elections.